evening. Welcome to the February meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Our first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Does anybody on the board have any adjustments to the agenda? Anybody in the audience? Okay. Our second item, approval of the school board meeting minutes. First, the meeting of Tuesday, January 14th, 1992. Any additions or corrections? Okay, those minutes stand approved. And the special meeting of Tuesday, January 21st, 1992. Loretta? Uh, number two, third line, Peter Leslie voted, second by Charlie Greer. Peter Leslie motioned. Okay. Rosemary? Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. In um, item number one, paragraph four, uh, regarding my motion, I believed I moved. I did not uh, check the tape, but my intention was to have the superintendent proceed with steps leading up to the application prior to the 415.92 deadline. Anything else? Okay. Those minutes are approved. Okay, next comments by our middle school representative. Hello. Hi. The indoor track swim practice and girls basketball is underway. The paper recycling throughout the middle school is going quite well. There is a dance for the 7th and 8th grades, February 28th, and there is a parents' meeting in the middle school for the upcoming Tuonki. The middle school will start an Archangel Food Drive and the Magazine Drive after vacation. I would also like to say that James Kittredge is not able to make this school board meeting because of a, a recital for a play. Thank you. Thanks. High school representative? Representatives. Okay, um, we now have put the midterms behind us and are now well into the third quarter. Uh, both the swim teams and basketball teams are out of regular season and about to start the championship time. Um, in fact, the swim team, bo both swim teams won Southwesterns on Friday and Saturday. Two weeks ago, Cape hosted the Southern Maine Music Festival and that proved to be a success and also the blood drive was held on Friday and we received much support from teachers, students and parents. <coughs> recently, recently the parents forum sponsored a panel discussion about curriculum and it included seven students from the high school on the panel. Some of the issues that were brought up included whether or not classes should be leveled, the possibility of having a project in May or in the spring for seniors, the possibility of reducing the industrial arts requirement from one year to just a half a year, the value of writing research papers, and also the value of electives for seniors. I think all the students really got a lot out of this discussion, and we did appreciate the chance to, to give our input, and we hope to work again with the Parents Forum in the future. Thank you. Any comments from the board? Or I, I think that was a really great meeting. Um, since I don't have a child in high school yet, it's really refreshing to hear your views, and um, I hope we can do that on a more regular basis. I also want to uh, comment, if we turn that on, I guess. Um, not only were the comments interesting, but they were extremely well presented. And I think that the, uh, frankly, sitting there and listening to some of your, your interests, um, we need to do more of that because there were a number of, of insights that you, I think you gave us all, uh, you and, and your colleagues. I certainly compliment all of you for being willing to speak up. That was nice. Uh, yes, I was also in attendance at that meeting, and I do want to thank the high school students for taking the time to share uh, with the uh, other parents, administration, and school board members their views, and I would like to see more of those uh, happening throughout the school year on a regular basis. And, and the board members that were not there were filled in by the board members who were there, so we're, thank you very much. Okay. Business manager's report. <coughs> 
Thank you. Uh, page 57 in your agenda outlines the uh, revenues for the general program. And what I have done, I think, was passed out to you people this evening is a, uh, a revision of the anticipated revenues for this year. Based on the state uh, cutbacks, we will receive $1.945 million from the state instead of the two point uh, two oh seven seven that was anticipated or a, a cutback or shortfall of $131,000. However, we did pick up property tax relief for $7,287 that was not anticipated when the budget process was ongoing. Uh, the energy money or the grants that we had applied for for 18633 uh, were not approved from the state because of the shortage of the, the uh, monies available. They had $400,000 to meet all the state ne state's needs for the schools. Uh, miscellaneous revenues in the amount of $40,000 were budgeted and we anticipate to recover or, or receive $58,000. And our cash balance that was projected last year for June 30th in the amount of $50,000 uh, came in at $47,389. Therefore, based on our projected budget of $9,203,774, we should or anticipate to receive $9,075,000 or a shortfall of $127,905. Uh, what we have done through the process also is gone through the, the budget and have identified certain areas where we hope to recoup this uh, shortfall. Uh, my proposal to, to uh, in this memo to Connie is that next week during vacation week is that we go, I look at all the accounts uh, and try to estimate uh, from those accounts any balances or shortfalls that might exist in other accounts for June 30th. Any questions on the revenues? The following two pages uh, highlight the general expense budget for the same program. To date, we have expended uh, $5.281 million, or roughly 57% of our budget. Uh, most of the accounts are current. Uh, what we've noticed in the last couple weeks or the last month or so is that uh, the bills are finally starting to slow down. Uh, most of the supplies, the books and that are in place and have been purchased and paid for. Therefore, uh, our warrants, I guess, for the next three or four months should get to be uh, a decrease in amounts. The next program to highlight on would be the federal and state programs as far as uh, grants that we've applied for. If you notice that uh, the teacher certification grant on line 18 the 14245 will not be received this year. Therefore, we have transferred the $3,700 that we had expended to the general program. That account will not be used for the rest of the year. Therefore, based on projected revenues of $204,000, we have received $146,000 and have expended seventy, dollars with a balance of approximately $75,000. <coughs> Under the food service program, uh, for the month of January, uh, the income, the net income based on the revenues less expenditures was roughly a net income of $3,600 with receivables of $5,000. To date, we have revenues of $154,000 with an expenditures of $162,900 some odd dollars for a loss in cash or decrease in cash of $10,000. However, based on the Based on the uh, fund balance statement on the following page for school lunch, uh, for the same period last year as it is this year, we have a positive cash flow this year, a positive fund balance of $4,067 compared to a loss or decrease last year of $8,900 or a change in fund balance of some $13,000 to the good. Charlie? Back on the federal and state programs, under item 23, Coalition of Essential Schools 9192, we've yep. expended 60, approximately $6,500. Yep. When will we receive uh, reimbursement? We received two checks. One came in last Friday, which will show up on your February statement, and one came in uh, on Monday. Uh, roughly 4500 of this has been built. The other $2,000 is in the process of being paid by. They're pretty current on it uh, through Brown University. So you'll see that reflected in next month's statements. 
Any questions on the school lunch program? Jan? If I'm reading this correctly, why would there be uh, $7,500 worth of unpaid food bills this year as opposed to only 2000 last year? Basically, ba uh, based on when the bills were probably paid, they were probably paid like a week before or after uh, they were this year. Uh, all in all, look at the, uh, look at the uh, subtotal on that line. As far as unpaid bills, we have 11000 this year compared to seven last year. But the, the main difference, I think, in this account as far as the fund balance is up in the, uh, in the top section where your year-to-date profit last year was at negative 48 compared to 16 this, uh, 32 this year. Your, your cash flow is, is really reflecting what your fund balance is. There's, there's a better uh, flow of monies in the amount of uh, receivables, the amount of $17,000. That takes into account also the $25,000 that has been transferred into the program. Sue has uh, highlighted for us the community services program. Uh, to date, they have collected $412,764 and have expenditures of $296,000. Uh, the enrollment report was from last month. We dropped or lost 10 students. Uh, the high school is now at 398 students in the 9 to 12 program, compared to 404 last month. So six students have been have uh, have left or are not in the school since last uh, since January. Uh, the middle school was is 374 for this month, compared to 372 last month, with the Pond Cove or the elementary K-5 program with 842 students this month compared to 848 last month for a total enrollment of 1,614 students. Mark? Uh, do we know where the egress of students occurred? Is that from moving out of town or are they going to private schools? Uh, what I've heard, uh, base, uh, uh, one was a move out of town like to Florida, uh, two that I know offers to private <coughs> schools at the high school level. I can get some more definite data for you and track that. I have the information on the high school. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, two went to um, out of state, one went out of the country, and three went to private schools right. at the semester change. One uh, was because of, of a scholarship situation, and two were due to choice. I, I mean, for other reasons. I don't know about the other schools. Ian? This is really a question for Connie. Are, are we doing or are we planning to do exit interviews on people who are leaving the system? Well, I've asked the high school uh, guidance counselor to give us a list of people actually um, discussing this a couple of weeks ago, um, at least starting with last spring. And uh, obviously, we can add these names too. Uh, I thought since we were using a questionnaire, we put a questionnaire out into the community, that it would be uh, interesting to send that to people with a note indicating that either we'd like to talk to them or perhaps they would at least uh, fill out the questionnaire. And um, certainly that information is very valuable to us, so we're going to try to get in touch with them that way. If anybody happens to be listening um, and you're involved, we would certainly enjoy hearing from you. Mike is not on. Whoops. <laughs> Say it again, Connie. Yeah. I guess that's on. I, I have I have prepared an exit interview questionnaire for for at least one of the students that they left and mailed it to their parents. I, I did not know we lost quite the number that we did. I thought we lost three and one I know one out of the country. So I will follow up on that and, and see that the other families get the same questionnaire. Because that, that is something that uh, I would like to to have some information on as well. And I can include, if you want, the questionnaire that was sent to members of the community, if that's Fine. part of I, I had talked to uh, Mrs. Merrill about that. I would just as soon send a letter from my office, but you and I can coordinate okay. it. Okay. I, I, I do think, though, we should be doing it also at the younger grades, too, not just high school. But mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, it might be more effective to just make a phone call. It's a pretty small number. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
making a phone call is more active. Sending a questionnaire is kind of passive and allows the recipient to put it on the bottom of the pile or file it. If the questionnaires aren't coming back, I'd make some phone calls. Uh, the other concern that I have is this is only the net change. Uh, we also had a new student come in to the high school. So there were, the net change is six, but the movement was seven. And, and the last report I have in the agenda, on my agenda, or the agenda is the, uh, is a recap of the energy accounts. Should you want more details of these, I'd gladly provide them to you. I actually like this format better. Thank you. It's long due. <laughs> One other question. We've realized some savings in fuel oil and bus fuel. Have you projected to the end of the current budget year? I just looked at the numbers a while ago, Charlie, and I, th I think what's going to have to happen is we might have to uh, make some adjustments to the, uh, to the uh, utilities as far as the electricity bill or budget for next year. Because last year, I believe we came in uh, with a shortfall. I forget the number. And I think we're headed pretty much in the same direction this year. Uh, based on the, uh, the gallonage and all that for the fuel oil, that there should be, I'm not going to say a sizable amount of money, but there should be some money left in that account and also possibly in transportation. What we're doing this year, too, is we're posting uh, some of the transportation uh, costs or expenses to the, uh, an account that was set up in the athletic budget for... Uh, a lot of the athletic activities that occur at night and stuff like that. So we do do a direct entry on a weekly basis based on the, the number of hours or the, the cost that, that those activities did cost. It, they don't show up in transportation, but do show up in the athletic budget. Uh, but $20,000 between those two accounts that we've saved over last year is significant. Uh, as far as the uh, electricity account, it's like, uh, I think the system Last month is the first in like five or six months that the that the uh, usage has been was down. So hopefully that's a good sign. Rosemary, I can't resist the opportunity to ask on usage. Um, do we take steps to conserve energy, or do we have uh, lights burning in unoccupied buildings that you're aware of? I would. I do hear. I would say that we. Do not take that many steps to conserve. I would request that, if at all possible, that we do that, especially during the very expensive winter. And then, of course, it'll carry over to the spring. It will. Any other questions? Loretta? Under electricity, I, I see you've combined the middle school, high school unit. But that seems so much higher than the elementary. It's, Does it's, that also include this building? or? No, it's Why? it's uh, the middle. It's it's a uh, funny concept. The electricity, the meter for the middle school and high school is one meter for electricity. However, when it comes to heating the buildings, the middle school heats Pond Cove through through uh, underground pipes through the steam. So when when you're looking at the cost of a building, you're looking at electricity being middle school, high school is one one cost. But what we have done this year is we've hooked up another meter at the middle school, or I'm sorry, the high school that reads the, uh, the middle school, then we just subtract and we can get what the <coughs> high school reading would be, or the middle school reading would be, I'm sorry. Uh, it's one meter and it's always been like that. And I think it's probably better off because we get one demand charge for the one meter. If, if the system was split in half and you'd have, each meter would have a demand charge, which would probably be higher than what it is now. It's, that's a big, the bill last month was like $15,000 for the, for the uh, middle school, high school complex. But why would it be, why would those two buildings be seven times higher than Pond Cove? Or at least it was last year. This, well, it is. Uh, this year it is. It's seven, seven, eight, think, eight times higher. I think because year. basically of the different programs, the shops, the pool, the, uh, the, uh, uh, other big users would be the, the, the kitchens. Uh, the high school kitchen is all electric, I'm sorry. Uh, Pond Cove is, is uh, propane, so is the middle school. The programming, the, the shops, the, you know, as far as the uh, auto shop and all this, you know, there's a big usage compared to uh, the Pond Cove uh, Lunt. Uh, 
building. Where does this complex fit in? The town. The town. The town. Not ours. Good. I might, I might also point out that uh, Pond Cove is about 45,000 square feet. Middle school is about 90. In other words, the middle school alone is about twice the square footage, and the high school is about twice the square footage at the middle school. Um, the other issue, of course, is that we use uh, the middle school and the high school heavily for community services programs. Uh, it certainly is my observation that we, uh, we could uh, definitely improve on remembering to turn off lights, although sometimes uh, people are out of the room for a little while and going back in and so forth. Um, this is, I think, a very, uh, very ripe issue for us to be looking at, especially as we're talking about renovation. There are all kinds of issues, some of which are um, in the building studies that we've already received. There are all kinds of things being pointed out to us that are opportunities for us to uh, save, some of which we won't realize until we renovate because we have uh, inadequate circuitry of one kind or another. But um, just to remind you that the, it is a middle school, high school that gets the heaviest use and certainly by far the largest number of, of rooms and areas to be lit and what have you. Rosemary? I, the high school also has a pool and the middle school and high school gyms are used seven days a week. Thank you. Thank you. Communication. Studying those figures. Uh, I gave you a fairly extensive packet, and we've added a couple of things this evening also, so I will try to go down quickly. Uh, to begin with, the latest editions, uh, you just received um, a letter from a staff member, a letter of resignation, uh, Mr. Jerry Seal, who has been uh, on the Cape Elizabeth staff for 26 years, and uh, for this year and last year, uh, at his request was on a leave of absence um, and has uh, made the decision not to return to teaching to uh, to retire at this time and has sent us a letter to that effect so I've added it to your um, communications and you can act on that uh, resignation under personnel I also included a letter and I believe you have copies that you've just received you may or may not have had a chance to to read this uh, uh, interesting and uh, certainly, I think, helpful letter from the Biancos discussing some of the school issues as they see them, including some maintenance issues as well as curriculum issues. I included a letter in your packet that went home to you from uh, Mr. McDonald, the superintendent of schools in South Portland. He's alerting the school board to the fact that uh, the South <coughs> Portland School Committee uh, has been very concerned with what happened in the general purpose aid uh, cutback. Uh, particularly the method of cutting uh, and is alerting you to the fact that they are so upset that they are thinking about legal action and letting you know that that might be a course of action. Um, obviously that's not a, um, we're not being asked to sign on the dotted line tonight, it's just to keep you aware of what a fellow school board group is concerned about and uh, I'm sure you're also aware of reading some of those things in the paper. I included um, an article that uh, Mrs. Sylvia Wesley sent in about year-round schools. I know that many Cape residents have an interest either in or both uh, in extending the school year and possibly changing the way we go to school. Uh, frankly, I've talked to a number of people about that over the years and find that there's some very interesting trends going on. Um, I thought for a quick article, this one was particularly um, appropriate in that it, it alerted you to some of the variations, some of the, the pluses, some of the drawbacks. Um, and for anybody listening, this year-round school concept is, um, uh, they give three or four models. Uh, one of the ones that seems to be gaining the most steam nationally is the one that uh, basically, uh, I think similar to some European um, school, dis school uh, schedules where you go to school for about two months and have three or four weeks a break and then go back for two months and so on. Um, one of the things that that certainly opens up a lot of thinking about is adding two weeks, let's say, as, as the state has talked about doing, and I think nationally there's certainly a lot of concern about adding days to the school calendar. But when you walk into school on June 10th and think about how much educational benefit is going to come from adding two weeks so that people are going through July 4th, you get a little 
less than enthusiastic about wondering how much good is going to come at that time of the year. Whereas if we change our thinking about the way we go to school with those breaks uh, coming at uh, uh, shorter breaks but more <coughs> frequent breaks in the sense of uh, instead of one long summer break, um, it, it certainly opens up some possibilities of thinking about adding days that would feel a lot more productive. I certainly, before anybody gets enthusiastic about thinking, great, let's do this next fall, um, there are enormous impacts. Um, just take the sports program, for instance. I mean, uh, Cape Elizabeth School District can hardly change its secondary calendar without working in sync with the uh, schools around. And if people feel that having sports schedules mesh is a less than exciting reason to delay making changes, I just have to point out to you that that is a fact of life and I, I wouldn't want you to think that that was something you could change unilaterally. There are other issues too that have to do with um, taking advantage of some of the um, shared facilities like Portland Vocational Regional School and so on. Um, those districts that I'm aware of that have really experimented with this are usually large districts and usually uh, at the elementary level. Another problem for small districts is that if you do change the elementary, which is at least it doesn't have an interscholastic sports schedule to worry about, um, it is conceivable for families, for instance, to have elementary students on one schedule and to have secondary students on another. And I think people need to be aware that these are some of the complexities that come up when we get into these conversations. Nevertheless, it would seem to me that that is the wave of the future and we ought to at least be studying the issue. I, there is a, an address at the end for something called the National Association for Year-Round Education, we will be sending for that material. Also included an article, actually it's a couple years old now, but I thought it was a, a neat one since we've been talking about total quality. This is an article by Lloyd Dobbins on Ed Deming, 91 years old, um, one of the original proponents of total quality. I thought you might find that interesting. We have a communication here from uh, Mr. Richardson Co-chair, humanitarian aid for the Archangel Project. I note that the uh, middle school representative was talking about that. Um, this is a fairly organized attempt on the part of um, the area school districts and town groups uh, that have originally uh, been part of that Archangel um, Exchange Project to try to do something concrete about food. Um, and in fact, this committee has gathered uh, school liaison volunteers. They either have been or will be shortly in touch with our people at the, um, at the school level. Um, and obviously, I'm sure you probably will be hearing about this from your, um, your children at school or from neighborhood youngsters. Can I uh, make one comment then? By all means. Uh, this is more than a fairly organized program. This is a very organized program. Yes, I thought it had I happen to know because my wife is going to Russia uh, in 10 days to prepare the groundwork for that. She's been chairman of this organization for the last two years. Uh, and it, it really is a major effort to try to help the people in, uh, in Russia, you know, our sister city. And uh, I guess we're gonna try to fill three containers, Greater Portland, three containers with uh, food and medical uh, supplies. The food will go mostly to orphanages and old age homes and the medical supplies, I'm sure you've read in the paper, are very, very badly needed there. So I just wanted to add my personal endorsement and my personal involvement since I answer about 10 telephone calls a day at home on this subject. Well, it's one of those examples of being able to do something when you see uh, kind of not only a national but international issue and respond to it. Um, we'll have more details shortly. Uh, one of the last pieces of communication that I included in your packet was uh, a letter to me from uh, Mrs. Betsy Wiley's period four English class. They received a grant of the amount of $1,000 to be given to a nonprofit organization of their choice. The grant was given to us by the Maine Community Foundation for the Partners in Philanthropy Project. We have a few suggestions concerning the decision to choose an organization to receive the money. However, we've not made a final decision. One of the leading choices is Preble Street Resource Center, which helps to support the hungry and homeless. And uh, it is signed by those students. I have talked to Mrs. Wiley about it and conveyed our, our pride in their achievement. Also, uh, I think this is, this evening, it's, I find it interesting that our high school students are talking about community service 
Um, we have the Archangel project, and here is an example from one of uh, another one of our high school classes choosing to work on that. I personally commend them for that kind of, of um, altruistic endeavor. Uh, also, I think uh, you have a series of articles here that um, Rosemary brought in, and they are dealing with various current issues, particularly on some of the legislative pieces. Those are my communications. Thank you. <clears throat> Superintendent's report. Okay. Um, I actually, I have three major issues here tonight, uh, and I know we have a couple of others on the board in various places, so I will try to summarize and then answer questions. The first item is a, a summary of the language arts report. You certainly are aware of the issues that I've summarized in the cover sheet, um, a concern that many of our parents have had at the primary level as to whether or not uh, we needed to review just how we were going about our uh, reading program. We've had a number of meetings, in both uh, within the staff and also um, individually with parents, with small groups of parents, and uh, a couple of occasions with uh, larger groups. Uh, the memo I sent you summarized, uh, along with a memo from Beth Henderson, um, steps that we, specific steps, steps that we have taken uh, this fall and uh, so far this winter, uh, much of it trying to assess where we are um, and to do that kind of assessment taking into consideration a combination of standardized testing as well as uh, some one-on-one -on -one informal reading inventory assessments. Uh, I also included a sheet of uh, the summary of at least one of those. We use the Gates McGindy at the grades three, four, and five and a Burns and Rowe informal reading inventory at the second grade. Uh, clearly, none of us feel that those particular results are what we want to see. Um, we are seeing here, um, it certainly raises a lot of questions about exactly uh, what should we be expecting at what level. And I outlined a couple of uh, target pieces. We have some questions and major themes uh, on uh, Mrs. Ms. Anderson's uh, report. and. I think all of our conversation among the staff has been uh, the need to <laughs> assess where we are, take some steps, short steps and long steps, um, and I think I will just pause there and uh, let you make comments, ask questions, and, and reflect so you had had time to respond to this. Uh, I just want to also point out that I came across an article that I um, uh, have put on your, on your desk this evening on I thought it was a very thoughtful assessment of reading programs from sort of a balanced perspective. Uh, the point it really makes is there is no one perfect method and that of all the mistakes schools make, it, uh, the worst is a ping pong back and forth um, going heavily to one method or heavily to another. What we absolutely have to find is a way of balancing out diagnostic and prescriptive measures so that we really do hear what each child is telling us. We set some standards that we feel we can and should be meeting and uh, base our, uh, our programs on those kinds of issues. Questions or comments? I have a comment to make. The, the results are very worrisome in terms of the achievement of, of children, especially at the lower grades. And uh, I think that uh, some parents will see these results and become appropriately concerned. On the other hand, I, I think that, to me at least, there is a real sense of relief with the results of these scores now available. And that is that for the past two years, parents have repeatedly voiced concerns that there was a problem. And generally, the two answers were, there isn't a problem, everything's fine, your child is doing well, or acknowledgement that there was a problem, but this is just really a, a very small minority and it's an exception, exceptional child that's having a significant problem. And I, th I think that uh, what we have now with some documentation is that, and acknowledgement of the school system is that there is a problem. And that is the most difficult part I think in this is acknowledging when a problem exists. We know there's a problem, that it exists. Um, with my time on the curriculum committees and the joint study committee, it's very clear to me that 
the Cape Elizabeth had the resources to address the problem and to meet the challenge. The uh, problems that we see in the language arts program are not as a result of lack of effort, and they certainly are not related to indifference. I think all the greatest resources in our school system are both the teachers, the parents, and the students, and that with a credible effort, we can easily produce a program that will be top notch. Yeah. Um, I, I think we need to, to make it clear um, to people uh, that these kids are going to be retested in the spring, is that correct? Yes. Um, that some remedial measures are being taken now to, to help out the kids who are uh, below grade level and that hopefully we will see some uh, short-term improvement while we're working on the long-term problem. But I would also like to reiterate that we really need to keep parents apprised of what we are doing. Uh, to to work on this problem and I also just have one further um, question uh, the the children who are in fifth grade now did they start out with whole language I don't think they did I'm not sure I'm looking to see if we have any staff that's because we've been on the board five that. years and that's happened since we which I don't know um, just in conferring with Nancy, who was there at that time, I think that they did. I know one of the concerns that's come up that may be relative to that is the uh, issue of, of the point at which there were children who had the pre-kindergarten experience. And I know that that's been a little bit of a piece of this, of, of this whole issue. Now, I don't know whether that's relative time-wise. Um, to the fifth graders or not? Perhaps it's not. But. Well, my my understanding, just from talking to some parents, is that you know they're trying to remember back whether their kids had whole language or not. Most of them feel that they probably did not, at least in first grade. I I, I think we just need to be very careful because there was some talk that somehow these kids catch up or something by the time they get to fourth or fifth grade. If these kids did not have whole language um, when they first started learning to read, that's you know, a fallacious well, assumption, well, and, and we need to. Well, certainly the numbers it. indicate that they catch fire later on. If you look at the above grade level, it goes steadily upward from 27 percent to 65 percent above grade level. But what I'm, but In what I'm, way, yeah. The question is, are they catching fire? I think you're suggesting no. Well, I, I'm saying I'm, I'm not sure that we know unless we know that these, that the fifth graders learn through whole language and you know, starting in first grade. Um, we don't have any other test scores to go by, but I, I think it would be interesting to know whether those kids had whole language or not. I think we, we also need to be careful, though, to make the um, villain in all of this whole language. And I mean, I, I think whole language can be done very well, but as Connie said, you don't use one method totally and nothing else because some kids, there are kids that do not respond to whole language. There are some kids that truly do if it's well taught. So, you know, I think there are so many different um, <coughs> parts to this that we have to be careful not to point our finger at just one thing. No, that's absolutely right. I just don't want there to be an assumption made that something clicks at some point because of a particular system, that it just takes longer for it to show up or something like that. I think we just need to be clear about that. Okay. Uh, in regards to, to uh, doing away <coughs> with pre-kindergarten, mm -hmm. I, I made up my mind when, when we did that that I would always allow for that segment of students who were not probably at grade level when the rest of the students were and mm -hmm. it might have taken a little longer but I, I noticed that 50 students were below grade level in second grade and our pre-kindergartens were never 50 students they were 12 or 13 students or or maybe 14 students but they weren't 50 mm -hmm. so I, I feel like that's such a large number that, um, that that you know that's far and above yeah the pre-kindergarten students right. that, that we you know well, what was the last year of pre-K? It was about four or five years ago. So a second grader couldn't have ever had pre-K here. Right, right. But, but, right. but some of those students probably, you know, would have been in a pre-K program had we provided for it, but not 50 of them. That's true. I see your point. You see my point. Yeah, exactly. And okay. so, I mean, if that number was 16, I'd say, there's our pre-K kids. Mm -hmm. 
and they're just coming along a little slower, but they'll, you know, they're very well aware of them and they'll be up to grade level. But it, the number's not 15 or 16, mm -hmm. it's 50. And so that's, that's uh, a concern. Uh, yeah. What is the number of, uh, of our students that have had uh, pre-K somewhere else? Uh, it's very high, isn't it? Like 75%? In effect, have been at uh, 90. 90. 90 percent of our kids, according to a kindergarten teacher two meetings ago, have attended a nursery school. Yeah. It's not necessarily a pre-K program, but it is a nursery school setting prior to coming to our class. But I wouldn't call that a pre-K program. No, not public school. Well, why not? Uh, well, I, I don't think they start on academic. Things. Probably to the extent that it would be in the, in the school system. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do, but I think it's still more learning to get along with others. But as a follow-up to Peter's question, um, I would like to know, could we separate the results of our students that started and stayed in Cape schools and those who came in from other school systems? I think we could do that. I, that hasn't been done at this point, but I think I think that would show um, a, an even different picture. But one thing I think we have to keep in mind is that we're not comparing. This isn't a pre-K case study. That's this right. is a national study. No matter how you cut the pie, we're way behind. And so I think we need to address it globally. Certainly not pointing any fingers, but it, it needs to be a, a unified approach. And we can't be looking at sub-segments and saying, well, it's only 30% due to these kids or 10% due to these kids. It's an entire program that has to be assessed, mm -hmm. and we're assessing an entire grade, and the results are consistent and fall on a, on a scale that forms a fairly straight line. I think what's encouraging, too, is the fact that, you know, that there are some definite kinds of things that are happening. The assessment has been made, and we're looking at short-term and long-term kinds of things and ways to address this. Um, and they're ongoing. Um, some are formal situations, some are informal, um, involving training of, of, um, of staff in various and sundry ways, and I think that's, that's very heartening. I think also we have to be careful not to strictly focus on the below grade level column because I'm wondering how many kids there are that are in the on grade level column that really could very easily be in the above grade level column with more work mm -hmm. as well. I think that's a good I think that's a good point, Jan. Also, I think that we need to, to think about the fact that these this assessment was done in November and that we're going to be redoing this in um, in the total second grade and in um, in third grade where the teachers see that there is there is a need to do that. So I think that that will give us another picture and more information, too. What's the timeline for the retesting? Do you, do you, do you know which month it's going to be done in? Or? I believe at the end of March, and I think, um, I believe it was, it was second grade, it may be the first part of April. Maybe a little bit later than that for second grade. On these tests, what should a community like this expect to see? That we have a broad range of results here. Uh, what would we be happy with? What, in, realistically, what, Mark, you probably thought about this. Well, uh, I have. One of, one of the interesting phenomena that has been described is the fact that if you look at above grade level, at fifth grade, they're 65 percent. And certainly in this, in this community, we should be above grade level a, a significant more amount than, say, inner city New York for multiple reasons. Um, but one of, the, one of the worrisome things is that as you progress down grade levels to the second grade, we have 27% above grade level and 42% below grade level. And so you have to ask yourself, well, how, how can we address these problems? And it, there are, certainly it's multifactorial. Um, I think there is probably some truth to the concept that whole language children, uh, because of the, the way it's presented, become more comprehensive readers at a later time than perhaps phonetically based readers. Uh, and that they blossom late. That may be part of it, and that's an all right part of it. It, it may be that the fifth graders had a, a different program, and very clearly they had a different program than the second graders, even if you call it whole language or not. It was, a, it was a phased in system, and it was a very different curriculum than what the second graders had. And so the question is as well, maybe it's because the curriculum was different and it, it was inherent in the curriculum 
that these children are not going to achieve. And then the, th the third option is, is that there's some significant reading recovery that the teachers are performing in the upper grade levels and they're just successful at getting recovery of these students who may not have done well in the lower grades. And I think those are probably all significant parts to the question. But if you look at how we address each one of those, um, you, you can forecast what may happen in the future. If we say that this is that whole that the current curriculum is is we think probably great and that they're just late bloomers, then we have five years to find out if that's the answer. And if we test it in five years and, and the sixth graders now are still forty two percent below grade level, we've made an enormous mistake that you can't recover. So we can't accept that argument by itself. It's simply unacceptable. Reading recovery is certainly a significant part of it. One of the letters that's encouraging is a, from a family member who writes that the reading recovery program that their child used was an enormous success. And the remedial parts that are being addressed by the school have been very successful. So that has to be one part of it. But I think the thing that we really need to do is put together a program that uses the advantages of both systems, the whole language system, the phonics system, and provide an all-around comprehensive reading program that will address each child. And I don't think we're doing that now. Well, one thing uh, I, I think also is I, I think the reading recovery program is great, and I'm glad it's targeting um, kids at the first grade level before they've gotten um, into a problem with not being able to read. Um, you know, we're obviously going to have to remediate the kids right now who, who are kind of in a mess with their reading at the upper grade levels. But I sure would like to see us get to a system where we're not remediating a whole bunch of kids who have no kind of handicap whatsoever and who should merely be reading, mm -hmm. um, you know, at some appointed time unless there's a specific problem we can point to. This is, it's crazy um, to be remediating uh, the numbers of kids we're, we're having to, uh, you know, at the, you know, it's second, third, fourth, fifth grade levels. It's, it's just, it's backwards. We shouldn't have to do that. But I, I, I'm, I just want to say that I, I really am encouraged at the progress that is being made this year. It is a breath of fresh air to have had this testing done. Um, you know, I'm, I've, I've found the staff members very um, open uh, to discussing this and working on the problem, and it, it's really encouraging, and I'm sure we're going to see a turnaround soon. What about involving uh, the parents even more by doing at least two things, uh, involving them in reading to their children. Um, I'm trying to think of a way of going beyond uh, just sending home notices and mentioning it at meetings. And uh, secondly, uh, just reinforcing the, uh, the need to turn off the television set more often. I think, I think both of those are, are very valid, Peter. Um, I think that teachers individually in the letters that go home um, to to parents encourage reading with, with their children. Um, I would say almost 100 percent of the teachers do that. Um, the other part of turning off the television, I think that that's, that's something we could look at and really maybe pursue that in a more vigorous sort of way. Um, I think it's worth looking into. During parent-teacher conferences, are the teachers stressing the need for parents to work more with children? Do you have any idea? especially those children that, that seem to need some more remedial help. I would I mean, say so, and I think, I think we have, with the conferences coming up in the spring, I think that's something that can be addressed again. Um, I think Anne's point, uh, suggesting that we really need to ask teachers to give feedback to, um, to parents about what is happening, uh, that I, I think that teachers are aware of that have been aware of it, but perhaps haven't been doing it consistently, consistently but um, We've talked about that very recently, and I think that there's a, you know, a definite movement in that direction. I think sometimes a face-to-face -face confrontation or enlightenment is a lot more than all these notices that come home. Mm -hmm. You wonder if 50% of them get read. So. That's true. Yeah. I think there, are, from what I've been told by other parents, there are a lot of parents that are working long hours with their yeah. kids at home, trying to teach them phonics, trying to, to. Uh, to, to make them the readers that they feel they're capable of being and that mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the frustration comes from because you know they don't want to be the reading teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. I think what might be worthwhile at some point to do is, is an evening. Uh, this was suggested at PCPA to spend a, an evening 
with parents or invite parents to, to deal with this, this <coughs> issue. Um, not, not necessarily in, a, in a, a rigorous threatening sort of way, but just to, to, uh, to give some parents some training and so forth to, to do this very kind of thing. And that's something that perhaps we can explore for this spring. Well, I just, you, know, you commented that a lot of the parents don't want to be the reading teachers. I think it's fair for them to think that they don't want to be 100% or 90%, but they've got a 10 or a 20 or a 30% role that's mm -hmm. really important. Oh, sure. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's, when I was addressing that subject, that's what I was uh, mm -hmm. uh, thinking of, that reading with the child, uh, discussing the book with the child, uh, that's just the child terribly read. important. But there's a there's a whole group of parents who have multiple yes. kids through a long age group who have kids in high school and then now have kids in early elementary school and they they tell me they're exhausted that that they don't understand why they didn't do it with their other kids but they're doing it now to a much greater extent and these are conscientious parents who always read to their kids who always had their kids read to them who don't have the TV on but are finding themselves spending. Uh, significantly more time than they had to with their earlier sibs to attain the same degree of reading proficiency. And so there is a very real deficit that parents are, or have been at least making up to some extent. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to reinforce that uh, point that Mark just made. The parents that are approaching me are parents who do read to their children, do listen to their children read, do work with them. Um, on the phonics and uh, phonetics and are totally frustrated at this point by the time they call me. Uh, and there are people that I know in situations of being other than uh, a Pond Cove parent because of course I'm not a Pond Cove parent. So I mean they're really uh, reaching when they call me and uh, I just feel that I have to enter that into the record that there are people who are doing everything that we're suggesting and they're still not even close to uh, satisfied. I, I don't know how much time we want to spend on the subject, but uh, I find it fascinating and I keep looking at these numbers and keep thinking of new questions. But to me, uh, these, these numbers show a very widespread inability, much wider than I would have expected. For example, I would have expected um, roughly 70% of the kids to read on grade level, and the other 30% to be above or below. And I wonder if, if that's normal. Is our school district, uh, uh, are we dealing with a wide range of abilities, motivation, background? Uh, that's my question. Okay, um, obviously, We've already spent uh, on staff and uh, many parent conferences of one kind or another um, far too many hours to summarize all of those points. I'd just like to make a couple of points. Number one, uh, it would be really critical for uh, both parents and school board not to uh, treat one test as if it were a final statement. What we certainly have here, I think, however, is a genuine opening up of the school, the school system is opening itself up for scrutiny here. The teachers are opening themselves up, the program is being opened up, and we are officially opening ourselves up for scrutiny, and I think that's a very healthy step. I agree with what has been said there. As far as exactly what this test means right now, we don't know. For instance, my suspicion would be that uh, if you want to know what I think a Gates ought to be in this kind of a community, depending on the familiarity of the students with the test because we're talking about very small children or at least young students where just unfamiliarity with testing skews the answers. On the other hand, that's a reason why we use the informal reading inventory at the second grade and in our conversations with teachers there is some recognition that what they're seeing in classroom performance is reflected in this too. So again, they're opening themselves up for scrutiny to what we should do and what is actually going on. Um, I think another issue that's going on here uh, that's not necessarily a reading issue but a classroom management issue is that uh, uh, for very good reasons many teachers are moving in a project oriented direction and so forth but that takes extreme skill to do uh, all the things that need to be done and still keep track of every single student. Um, and there are payoffs on one side or the other. So what we are asking of our teachers is to go beyond anything they have done in the past and to 
to really bring both methods together. Um, I talked with some staff who were alarmed that open scrutiny of the situation would cause the board or a significant number of parents to say, well, it obviously means that you throw out all the whole language and you dust off the, the, the basils and, and that's that. And I said, I can assure you that none of the parents I've talked to and certainly none of the board members uh, are of that opinion. They recognize that we are looking for a better program than we've ever had before, but that program is not one program. It is focusing on ways to have classroom management, uh, reading materials and reading approaches that really do zero in on each child. Um, so I think we've at least gotten that far. I can appreciate your concerns. I certainly appreciate the staff's concerns. And I think that this is uh, kind of an uncomfortable uh, moment of truth, but it's also a very positive uh, step in the right direction. Exactly what you would expect of a test of the kinds of youngsters we are likely to see in the school district, uh, then getting back to your original question, uh, it's hard to predict. I would personally uh, expect to see it skewed to the above average. And I think the real issue for us from a curriculum point of view and probably as a district in general is uh, to set a standard that is higher than we are now doing um, to stretch ourselves. We were at a meeting on Friday where we were, it was an exciting moment when one of the teachers stood up and said, we're going to uh, set a world-class standard. It wasn't exactly the reading program alone that she was talking about, but I thought that was the kind of thing we certainly want to set for ourselves and then be realistic as to the effort and the support that we all have to give teachers to meet those kinds of standards, and our students, of course. And, okay. Um, I think I've said this before, somebody else has a previous meeting, that we really should get um, some people who worked on the kindergarten, on that kindergarten grant, the Emerging Reader right. uh, grant to come and talk to the board and so to the general public about um, the really exciting things in, in reading assessment that is starting to be done that I hope will trickle upwards. Mm -hmm. I guess it can't trickle upwards, but. <laughs> You know what I mean. Bubble up. <laughs> bubble, up down yeah. bubble up. I think of the bubble up <laughs> into the other Words race. I, I certainly agree, and I think that they really have set a, a fine model that includes assessment, that includes working with parents, and it's just a whole wonderful combination of things that are working very, very well. And, um, you know, I think we can look, look to that as a good beginning in lots of different ways. You think they might be willing to come next month and talk to us? Excellent. Could you ask them? Certainly can talk to them or about it. Sure. after, but sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Common Core Community Dialogue Meeting update. <coughs> um, again, I'm not going to, we've certainly, I think, covered some of these issues, uh, at least in, in general. Uh, I, I gave you the sheet that is a summary of the vision statements that the staff came up with during our uh, workshop day in January. This document has been distributed to all staff members um, and the next piece that will be coming down will be the summary of the questionnaires uh, which uh, I'm looking at Ann because I think we're going to work on that together. Uh, what I would see as uh, both a, um, a really exciting goal here as well as a manageable one as long as we don't expect it tomorrow is that when we get the summary from the questionnaires we put this sheet together with the community sheet and the points that come up in the questionnaire uh, perhaps that would be a good time to have a kind of town and staff meeting and put all of our easel sheets around the high school cafeteria uh, and ultimately the board writing a mission and value statement or a mission statement and listing the values um, we, I would hope that we could do that by the end of the school year, have it in a pamphlet form, and that you would start your next year as a board with uh, a really, I think, valuable insight into what both the community, the staff, and your own uh, view as a catalyst are setting as a vision for this school district. Budget issues. Well. Two weeks from now, I come to you with a um, budget that represents the building requests, the administrative review, my own review, um, and some work as best we can judge about what the impact on the tax rates 
would be. I have to say at this point, we do not have a subsidy printout from the state. Um, that means that we don't really know exactly what we're dealing with for numbers. We are going to be we're building this budget with a uh, fairly conservative number. We hope that is uh, taking in, into consideration this year's subsidy, the cuts that we already have received this year. Uh, that means we're starting the budget year uh, approximately $143,000 less than we had next year. In other words, just bringing in a level budget. We're 143, about a 1.5% uh, uh, over what we did this year. Uh, and there are all kinds of implications, which I will be spending some time in two weeks from now um, <coughs> going through for you and, and the community's benefit. Um, I have to say at this point that the budget I'm looking at right now is one that's very uh, conservative. Both staff and administration have been, um, I think, very uh, fiscally responsible, but we do have needs. We have issues that we have to uh, um, meet. We can't have just exactly the same budget we had this year and carry on. So those are issues we'll be talking about. The, my biggest concern is that I don't know what we're going to get for subsidy. And that meeting is Tuesday, February 25th at 7.30 here, is it? Or I, oh, that, at the high school. That's the high school, school cafeteria. School. We weren't able to schedule it here. So that will be taped for later? It will be taped and played back. Okay. And then that Thursday, February 27th at 7.30 will be the Pond Cove K-5 through and middle school budget. School board subcommittees and reports. The first one is the policy subcommittee and Chapman. Well, you all received a summary of the meeting we had January 23rd, and it's fairly self-explanatory. <laughs> we went through sections C, D, and E, uh, reviewed and accepted most of the policies. Um, the school bus safety program is uh, the changes are being looked at, the ones that were submitted. Um, we are planning to move all the administrative guidelines to the back of the book just to make it less confusing. Uh, Connie will be going through all those guidelines with the administrators, um, suggesting revisions. And um, at that point, we'll take a look at those and see if maybe some of those guidelines should, should have uh, board policies to go along with them. Um, so we're meeting tomorrow going over sections F, G, and H. That's my next. Okay. Is that it? Or That's it. Okay. Next is the Finance Subcommittee, Peter Leslie. Thank you. There's not a lot to report. Uh, we're <coughs> going to be meeting uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, you've heard from the superintendent on the, uh, the budget process. Uh, it's really quite difficult at, uh, at this time to do any uh, consideration, enter into any considerations of the alternatives in the absence of knowing what the state funding is going to be. Uh, last year at this time and on earlier uh, occasions, we've had the printout and uh, we'd already been able to discuss uh, what the implications were of, uh, of various decisions that we might make, particularly the, uh, you know, the effect on the tax rate. We just can't do that now, so uh, we have to wait until we uh, until the legislature makes that decision, and it's going to make the budget process uh, quite, I think, quite difficult and uh, quite uh, protracted. Uh, we did start uh, negotiations with the largest bargaining unit uh, today. Uh, Sorry, actually, it was our second meeting. Uh, and we'll be discussing that in executive session later on. I think for the time being, uh, the message is simply stay tuned. <laughs> for all of us, yeah. Okay, thank you. The next one is the Joint Study Committee, which I will be reporting on. Um, first of all, I want to say that I, am, I was very impressed with my fellow committee members, Randy Perkins, Gary Lenoy, Phil Jewett, Julie Salikas, Shari Robinson, Connie Goldman, Mark Foray, Clark Smith, Mary Bruns, and Beth Henderson. 
um, this committee was truly dedicated to the task of merging the career ladder and the index in a responsible, intelligent way. We now have a draft, and I want to stress that it is a draft, of a Cape Elizabeth teacher evaluation plan, which has been distributed to the school board and the executive board of the teachers group. And over the next few weeks, the teachers and the school board will read it and make comments. Then the committee will reconvene to discuss the comments and make appropriate adjustments. The document has nine sections. I'll summarize it um, for the people listening at home so they have some idea what we're talking about. Uh, some of the, I think, important points are first, the, evalu the evaluation instrument applies to all teachers. It focuses on assuring competence up to a professional level, and beyond that, it emphasizes individual goal setting. Instead of level four and five with merit pay, the recommendation is to establish stipended positions. Uh, the use of a number rating scale has been dropped, but support for teachers uh, using support groups and so forth will continue. Administrators will have staff development to ensure system-wide consistency in the interpretation of the standards. The primary purpose of an evaluation system is to promote continuous improvement in achieving the goals of the system for student learning. The first two years of a teacher's work in this system are on a probationary status. Then the administrator will meet with each new teacher for a pre-conference and then have a minimum of three classroom visits, one being unannounced, and a post-conference will then be held. After these two years, a teacher may be put on a continuing contract as a professional level teacher. The basic competence of this teacher has been established, so the, ed the evaluation procedure now shifts from proof of competency to support for continued growth by establishing a goal-setting procedure. The goal should be established in accordance with their potential impact on student learning and include teaching goals, learner goals, program goals, and organizational or administrative goals. The goal setting evaluation will now consist of a minimum of three classroom observations, a review of product and procedure toward established goals, and a critique of student evaluation and accountability. These evaluations will take place on a three-year cycle. Then there's a, a section in here on evaluation standards, and some of the major topics are planning for instruction, delivery of instruction, evaluation of student progress, classroom management, professional development, and that's it. The rest of the document then describes qualifications for the teacher leadership positions. Uh, once again, this is a draft, and these, uh, you know, this is subject to change, but this is where we're at with it now. Are there comments, Rosemary? Um, yes, I had several questions um, regarding this, and I was wondering uh, the best way to handle it. Is it to write you a memo citing the information that or to have a meeting with someone to, to ask the questions with with the teachers there's a, a form it, I think was it on ours too that to yeah. fill out mm -hmm. a comment form that that probably would would be the best way and then we can um, you know have your comments with with the others as well and, and there are um, I I spotted three typos in it that don't change the significance, but I just thought I'd bring those to sure. it, It's so obvious how much time was put into this. It really is a, a really well-drafted document. It seems to cover everything. Any time I was looking at it, I said, well, what about this? Usually if I turn the page, it's on the next page. <laughs> but um, I, I do have some specific little comments that I will put on the sheet, but it's obvious what a lot of hard work all of you put into this. If there is any comment or question that you think it would be important for us to discuss as a board at this meeting, you should bring it up now rather than just use the comment sheet. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, they're, very, they're okay. just little wording issues. My, they aren't really substance okay. issues. Okay. 
I just have to make a comment, having served on the original <laughs> career ladder evaluation committee, and we got to a point where we really could not agree on, we, we, there were points that we could agree on, but when I see the success that came out of the current uh, committee, I, I'd have to commend you, having served on the original. It was quite different. I would like to comment on that, having been on the committee. I was very much impressed with the openness of the people on the committee and the conscientious effort that was put forth by all members. There was a very clear sense of cooperation. It was very uh, upbeat, future-oriented, and I think is a sign of how the uh, Cape Elizabeth school system is progressing globally. Well, I have one comment. Uh, I, I suppose I played a, uh, a very minor role in this process in that uh, last year sometime I shuffled around some numbers and uh, we discussed those numbers a lot, kind of like you shuffle a deck of cards to move these two uh, uh, payment uh, systems into one. And when I read this document for the first time, and I remember at the time thinking, Boy, those numbers were easy, but how are they ever going to, how's anybody ever going to do this? Well, I think you've done it. I, I'm really, you know, just very impressed with it, and I, I, uh, I suppose we'll all have some minor comments as we look at it uh, from time to time, but uh, I think it's, a, it's an amazing uh, step, so. Well, maybe it's just where people's fortes lie because I could never <laughs> do what you did with the numbers. I don't, in my mind, call that in any way minor. Um, so I think there have been many significant contributions from all sides. Any other I, I did want to comment, uh, although I have several questions, none of them are uh, substantial in terms of changing anything that's here. It's just more of a historical perspective and also I was interested in how the stipend uh, arrangements are going to be done but I think the formation of the committee later in the agenda will address that but I did want to make sure that the formation of that committee was somehow related to this document okay. when that time comes I simply want to also say that um, this project uh, was really difficult and that uh, again the cooperation of the group uh, and the committee I certainly want to commend everybody that was involved too and I also want to say that um, I realize that there are people who feel the career ladder uh, is sort of a black and white issue it is not like everything else um, this system has struggled hard to put into words standards of good teaching and I heard repeatedly from staff members not only on this committee but in other areas people want to be proud of being called a professional teacher and that the intent of this document is to take whatever uh, work went on in that under the career ladder banner and move it a step further uh, I think it is significant that this is a document that will apply to every member of the staff it is not a splinter document. It is the entire staff, and I feel that that really is a step forward. Mm -hmm. Town Center Committee. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I passed out a three page report at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I would like to draw your attention to your first number three on page one, which should be renumbered number two. And the Four areas that I would like to draw your attention to are t uh, 2F, 3D, 3J, and 5E. Just to let you know that the committee is discussing these, um, I am serving uh, on the town center subcommittee uh, committee, excuse me, as a school board member and as the school's representation on that board. So I see my position as both reporting to you issues that pertain or could uh, impact the schools, but also to give input to the committee on how uh, the schools um, could or could not uh, react to those uh, suggestions. So I will be keeping you informed as things uh, are developed further. Um, this may not be the appropriate time to bring it up, but I will, um, unless you ask me to uh, defer. And that is uh, regarding the traffic pattern around the high school again this weekend was um, 
I won't go so far as to say dangerous, but I'll say time consuming and could have been uh, uh, a problem for some people. Uh, we hosted the Southwestern swim meet and there was a uh, large basketball game on Friday night and there was another uh, so why the electricity, the electricity at the high school is so high. Uh, it was a, a packed building Friday night and Saturday, and I do think we need to address those uh, outside of this report, but that's what reminded me to bring it up again. That's the end of my report. Okay. Has, has this been adopted? No. It's, it's in discussion. It's, in discussion. it's being presented. Uh, through community meetings and ultimately to the um, town council. And I think you can see by my notes why I'm bringing this to your attention now. I, I wrote a note on the last page. Community team? Uh, yes, I'll report that tomorrow evening in the high school room 205 at 730. There is a community team meeting. End of my report. Okay, thanks. Unfinished business. Report on special school board meeting of Tuesday, January 21st, 1992. Um, basically, uh, the major issue to remind everybody about there is that I think people are aware that you moved to establish the kindergarten at the high school next year. Uh, at the same time, we also talked about a transition team. And I did include in your packet a brief outline of my understanding of the membership of that team. I thought it would be useful for our um, moving along, having meetings, uh, to have some input from you as to the scope of work and also uh, the somewhat difficult issue of a point, actual appointment to the transition team. That is, we've had a number of citizens who are interested in this, both parents of children in the system and ch incoming children, um, and we have a, a high degree of interest in uh, on staff. We can't have everybody that's interested on the on the group, um, so I would would be interested in some guidance and uh, some help from you as to determining a process that will be seen as fair but efficient. Um, if you think that I've got it right as far as the representative pieces, I'd appreciate some feedback on that. Uh, and also the scope of work. The scope of work piece, I think it's really important for people to understand. It's not every single decision that's going to uh, have to deal with uh, the nuts and bolts of this move is going to go through this transition team. Um, I mean, that would bog us down to an impossible degree. I, I see this team as a form, I'll just read what I wrote out here, scope of work. The transition team is intended to provide a form for discussion of projected needs will be involved in reorganizing the grade structures. In addition, since there are modifications to the high school building to be discussed, this group will serve as a planning group to review architects' proposals and to make recommendations to the school board for final approval. This group will be an advisory committee to the superintendent and the school board. Uh, and I think we need to be clear about that up front so that people don't have the mistaken um, sense and then get upset later on down the road that somehow a decision got made at the board or the superintendent level. Uh, we will certainly, I will certainly try hard to make sure that there is a uh, timely, that there are timely meetings, that issues are presented in the right sequence so that we uh, aren't looking at them at the absolute last minute. We really do value the input. We want this to be a successful uh, transition. Uh, but at the same time, um, I would not want people to think that every single piece of this is, has to be uh, accepted by every single member of the committee. We'd never get it done. Rosemary? My observation is if everyone were to have one vote, there are 12 members and there should be 13 or 11, preferably 13 uh, for an odd number. Um, and if that is the case, I would suggest a school board member and the school board chairman. I have another suggestion for the 13th member and that is a parent who is not yet uh, who does not yet have a child in the school system uh, which was mentioned as previous meeting preschool or parent or something that, that, that actually when it says parents it was intended to be oh, okay include and actually they see these actual numbers it's somewhat open-ended there are in some cases there might be two from one section mm -hmm. um, so I had didn't actually set a number didn't intend okay. to find 
I was just going to make a comment that you've got 11 representative groups without the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're looking at 11 people minimum, mm -hmm. right, as, a, as a representative of each, it, it looks like that you may need more representation from, otherwise it's going to be very heavily, I think you need, I think you probably need two to three parents mm -hmm. because it's very heavily weighted in, in the side of, of the school system. I don't think, though, that this is that kind of situation. I mean, the, ba the isn't the basic point to get input from various groups. So I don't think it really matters how much. It, I don't think it, it'll weight anything. The thing is to get everyone's concerns and suggestions aired. So I'm not sure that's a real big issue. But I, I, I would agree that a pre, mm -hmm. someone who's coming mm -hmm. into the system mm -hmm. would be very useful to know what's on uh, those people's minds. Okay. Beth? Um, I had a request. Okay, Beth just said that uh, she had a request from the special education group to be represented as well. Do you, do you know, uh, looking at this, were there other grade levels that wish to be represented other than K and 4? Uh, yes, first grade had asked as well if they might not be because they're transitional in a sense, I think, from their point of view of, rec of uh, receiving kindergarten students. and connecting with kindergarten students. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. For why don't we go down? Uh, let me. Oh. Madam Chairman, may I ask if that request might be more of the end of the transition period as opposed to the September transition period that I thought that this uh, team were uh, focusing on? Am I wrong about that? I'm sorry, I don't like to see. The uh, first grade teachers as being the receivers of the displaced kindergartners. So in other words, this is a committee that, that will stop meeting before the first grade teachers would actually need to have input as far as receiving the students. I'm, I'm, I am just trying to understand the charge of the committee. The way I understood it was that we're moving or we're putting a fourth grade back into a uh, different configuration and we're moving kindergarten uh, to another building. And it, I, I'm just concerned uh, that if a group gets too large, uh, then perhaps what uh, their charge is gets diluted somewhat. And I, I thought I was clear on what the charge was, but now I'm confused. I, I would agree with that. I, it was really my impression um, that this would be done, um, you know, by by the time the school year started. You know, I don't think we can have a transition team going on forever. If we have another need that comes up, maybe we can address it at that time. But my my impression was that this was to deal with the immediate move situation. Um, well, another possibility, too, um, is the issue of having a core team with, with um, for instance, special ed first grade coming to a meeting that's going to focus on those issues. Uh, it would seem to me that we do run the risk. I'm sure the second and third grade probably has some issues, too. Uh, and we really uh, were, I agree, I think the scope of this group is to flesh <coughs> out or to consider uh, implications of this move that uh, so far we have only we think we've got them all but we know there are probably going to be some things we don't yet understand totally um, I would see that then is, uh, is suggesting that those non involved or only marginally involved and I am careful when I say that because I'm immediately realizing there may be some moves from room to room within Panko but specifically fourth grade moving from one building to another and kindergarten moving from one building to another. Those are the focus pieces. The other pieces are important. They should have their, their opportunity to share, give input, and to um, be heard and so forth. Uh, but I don't see how we can have a working group that has a kind of, uh, you know, too broad a base or we will um, just create problems for ourselves. Okay. If I may go one step further, um, 
I put a real um, heavy value on time. And one of the other concerns that I have when seeing the fourth grade team here, I feel that that's a separate issue that the high school representation uh, do not need to be part of. I think that's a Pond Cove Middle School issue. I think that the makeup of the people on that committee are totally different from what I understood this committee's focus to be uh, at our last meeting. Did you say the high school as well? I didn't. The, here we have uh, four representative groups from the high school. And I think when we incorporate the fourth grade team uh, in this group, uh, they, the time discussing those issues don't need to have high school. I'm saying this backwards, but the high school representative groups do not have to be involved in the fourth grade move. The okay, fourth grade team point. does not have to be involved in the issues of moving the kindergarten to the high school. So I see them as two totally different charges. The makeup of those groups, totally different. And even the Pond Cove representation uh, at the administrative and at the team level, the allied arts team and the parents are totally different. So I hope that's clear. Well, <laughs> can we try this that's again? Easy. <laughs> um, there's a good point, I think, in, in thinking of this as a core transition team, which is essentially the kindergarten to high school and then having some of these other issues have a meeting that focuses on the high school, a meeting that focuses on the fourth grade concerns, a meeting that focuses on all others. And that the core group then, the question that should be asked is who are the people uh, who are beyond everybody else involved with that kindergarten move? I would argue it would have to include the school board. Um, I really. I think it ought to include the community services, partly because of transportation and some other issues, are the shared playground, the fence issues, there are a variety of issues there that I'd like to see that as part of the core group. Um, something from Pond Cove, <laughs> something from Pond Cove School, obviously, I suppose, kindergarten, um, and parents and administration. And then as far as a high school is concerned, and it might be interesting to get some feedback here from uh, Frank, um, maybe the high school really needs one person on there, so there's always one high school person there, but some of these other things like, it, like maintenance, the students, faculty at large coming in for a special meeting that was focused on the high school issue, maybe that's a way to make this manageable. Right. I, as I think about the actual playing out here, especially with so many people being interested, that if we have a group that focuses on the kindergarten to high school move, making sure that we have people there who really have paid some t attention to the core issues and and uh, can um, you know not have to start over from ground zero, and then have a meeting focused on this issue, focused on this issue, I can see that working pretty well. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, who from the school board is interested in serving? In this? <laughs> oh, what a surprise! Don't all hide at once. <laughs> okay, I am also. Um, so I can either, if we have two school board people, or I can be an ad hoc member mm -hmm. as chair. Whichever. Ex officio, I think. Would be, uh, <laughs> yeah, that right, sounds right. a little better than ad hoc. <laughs> <laughs> Chairmen okay. are usually ex officio. Oh, okay. Superintendents also, incidentally. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll change that. Okay. Uh, one community services representative, which Sue can be responsible for, for choosing. Um, from Pond Cove, an administrator, the kindergarten team, and uh, how does the board feel about parents? How many? I think two. One with the child one current, entering, one. entering and one, one with a child already in kindergarten? At Pond Cove. Or at, or at Pond, Pond Cove. Cove. Okay. So two parents. And Rick from the high school. And that's it. And then other members as needed. Is that? 
Do you want to just summarize it to make sure I've got it right? Uh huh. Uh, Ann Chapman, the school board, one community services representative, an administrator from Pond Cove, the kindergarten team, two parents, one with a child in Pond Cove and one with a child coming to Pond Cove kindergarten, Rick DeFusco as the high school representative, and the superintendent and the school board chair as ex officio. Okay. I, I wanted to question high, a high school student representative to be named by the SEC or someone. I would see that as coming about in the way the, uh, some of these other issues were. When we have a meeting focused on high school issues, we would be happy to invite them. And the other, only other concern that I had was uh, the Allied Arts team representation for the phone call. That would also be at a group meeting which would focus specifically on allied arts. Thank you. Those are the ad hoc members. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. With, with parents who would not be serving on the committee, recognizing the fact that they certainly should call people who are on the committee with the, if they have thoughts and comments, and also teachers give the comments that they have to those serving on the committee as well. We still haven't decided how to pick the parents. Oh, I was hoping <laughs> we were going to We need to, do, I've right had numerous that. people ask me, yeah. and I, I think we do need to uh, figure that out. And we do need to make sure that we've reached, for instance, the preschool um, parents, so we, you know, anybody who wants to come forward. I, I suggest that once we set a date, we have people come forward, give their name, we put them in a hat and we choose them. I don't know any other fair way to do it. Charlie? There, there is a process that the, that the town uses. The appointments committee? Where they fill out an, like an application. And I think they did that for the school space study committee. Yeah, they did. Do we have that time? Um, well, um, we've had a number of, of calls and notes. Um, I'm not sure if we have a count, but I, I would guess we have at least 12. Yeah. Mm. I would say, yeah, about eight, and I would say I think all of them are uh, with parents of children coming into the kindergarten. Mm. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think that uh, as we think about this having a core group and then making sure that we, we have meetings that are scheduled to offer a forum for particular interests, um, probably what we should do is have a meeting at some point where we invite the parents to come and have a general discussion. That might be one way of dealing with it. Uh, I just don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm really torn about the drawing the name out of the hat because we don't have a great deal of time. And if we have <coughs> 20 people who want to serve, I mean, it's not as if they were serving on a study board or right. something of that sort. Uh, it's really people just want to make sure they're interested and they want to make sure they're heard and probably we can do something a little informal in this case, but I will gladly defer your, your judgment. I'll take care of the internal and you can take care of the parent representation. <laughs> I would suggest that we have one be nominated or picked through the Pond Cove Parents Association and then ask the eight or 12 who have uh, called in if they would be interested in forming some type of group, cooperative group, and they could provide a name rather than us randomly choosing a person. If they know each other, that's a problem. You see, they're not organized. The Pond Cove parents are organized. But, all right, we have somebody in the audience. Yes, thank you. Yes, please come up. Hi, I'm Judy Lardner. I can't speak for who has applied. I myself have mentioned my name. I know there are several people I've talked to who are interested, and I know there's at least a few people who are very interested in getting together, um, whether it's to throw forth a name that they would feel represent them, or get together and try to lobby that single parent who ends up on there, because um, I feel very strongly, I'd say, choose me, choose me, but I'm not the only one. But if, um, I would be happy to help you contact um, mothers and fathers to see who might, okay. if they'd want to get together in that way. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Does that sound satisfactory then? Okay, one uh, parent will be appointed through the Pond Cove Parents Association, and if you would help us organize that, the other parent will be appointed through that group of volunteers. Rosemary? 
Well, I'll let Ann go first. Well, maybe. one one problem is what what is the timeline on this? We do need the timeline. The parents association doesn't meet again until March. Do you have an uh, executive board? Um, not really. <laughs> I mean, there isn't. A, I, d I don't think it would be fair for just the people who are, you know, serving as heads of committees or whatever to, to randomly choose a name. I, you know, I would even, I would really just feel more comfortable about choosing a name out of a hat than that because I know there is such a level of interest that I don't think it's fair just to, uh, you know, leave it to the people who have, um, you know, been lucky enough to come to a meeting or whose name pops into someone's mind at the particular moment. Could we advertise on Channel 38 uh, that we're, I mean, we will actually be doing that by the people watching for the next three days to school board meeting in this segment, but actually uh, put a note in there that to please, if you are interested in serving on this committee, to please uh, notify the superintendent's office of your interest by such and such a date so we can make this decision. because. I am concerned, since I'm active at the middle school level, of putting that pressure on a parents association uh, member, and I would like to see the board and the superintendent or the group itself choose a representative. Uh, and since there's no officer of the PCPA to ask if they are willing to uh, make that commitment, then I would be uncomfortable uh, supporting that suggestion. Do you have a, a suggestion or, or a date in mind for a first meeting? I haven't set a date, but it certainly would be uh, early in March because um, I would see this team as needing, especially as it's evolving in our discussion this evening, uh, at the very first meeting to take the calendar and determine uh, the focus of maybe four or five meetings. Uh, I do have some preliminary information from the architect. Um, we certainly have, a, I, my own feeling is that we have a lot of the issues identified and that uh, there are some cost factors that I'm keeping my eye on, but at the same time, um, I'm not sure that there's a great deal of ground to be covered here. There are some issues that um, uh, protocol and um, a variety of things that are, are not renovation issues that I suspect we could, we could get into, and I don't know how many of those will come up. But the sheer nuts and bolts issues are really not going to take us that long. At least I don't think they will, <laughs> although I'm often surprised by, by that kind of thing. I'd like to start in March. I'd like to plan to have um, a probably weekly meetings, and I would think that we could cover most of the groundwork in six to seven meetings, and I would, at the very beginning, bring in an, a, a preliminary agenda, have people react to it, um, obviously uh, fine-tune it at that point, and uh, then that would be pretty much it. Because I think we need to make, um, certainly any renovation decisions have to be made so that they're consistent with a timeline that I haven't, I, the architect and I have talked about, in order to get things done, we have to have decisions made long before the end of school. There are some issues, as far as staff is concerned, that are dealing with helping people make moves and so on. This could go on through May in one way or the other, but I, I would see this as primarily between February and April vacation, a working group. And well, then why don't we just set a date right after vacation for anybody who's interested to get mm -hmm. their name into you? Mm -hmm. When is the courier going out? It's three weeks before that, not not till after. It's Excuse me, it's three weeks because of the vacation. Three, three weeks. Okay. Okay. Well, we can do it. We'll do that. Okay. New business. Uh, personnel requests. Uh, first of all, we need to vote on the resignation of Gerald Seo. Um, do I hear a motion to accept his resignation? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Next, we have a personnel request for a half-time teaching assignment for next year. You want to talk to us oh, about that? Um, in summary, yes. The, uh, in your package, you have copies of letters. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with money. Thank you. Um, 
it's, they're in somewhat different form. That is, we have some job shares that are represented here and one reduced position request uh, that are ongoing uh, issues that have been granted in the past. Um, and then we have one that falls in a somewhat different category. I'll start with the ones that are ones that have been established. To a job share between Ingrid Stressinger um, and Leslie Knowlton, um, a half-time position uh, at the kindergarten level, Deborah Anderson, <coughs> um, and the uh, job share between uh, Deborah Cross and Barb Powers. Um, those are positions that have been established. They are ongoing. I would, uh, in, in some cases, there is some child care leave, for instance, in uh, Deborah Jordan Pearson um, involved, too, which is a concrete contract issue. I would certainly recommend that you continue those. What I have been looking for in the board minutes or in the, in the policy uh, background, I would be happy to listen to any guidance that those of you have been on the board for a while. I don't find any board specific decision on job share. I have some past practice on this myself and I have explained in your board packet that the normal understanding is that those are year to year positions. One of the things you have to be, several things you want to be concerned about and that is um, that when you have full-time staff members requesting part-time work, they have at the end of that one-year position the right to full-time uh, employment. Should all of our half-time or job share positions come due and everybody decide they want to exercise that right to full-time employment, we could get ourselves into um, a, an awkward situation. We might not, in fact, have openings. So that's why they are, it is recommended that these be strictly year to year um, and that they're reviewed with that in mind on a year to year basis. There are many attractive things about job share. Um, usually the system gets more than half time uh, work from a half time employee. On the other hand, there are sometimes things that uh, present some problems for one reason or another. Another reason why they're year to year uh, appointments to be reviewed by both the superintendent and the board. Um, the, the uh, other request, the new request we have um, is, on, uh, is from a teacher who could in fact ask for a year under contract of child care leave and, and what she's asking for is to come back half time. Uh, however, she's teaching at the second grade level which cannot be shared as two secondary positions can be shared with one teacher taking three classes and one taking two. When you have two teachers working together at the primary level, they are sharing the same group of children. So again, uh, it is general practice not to grant the job share for the one half. You grant the job share as a pair. You have two people coming in with that request. I have discussed that with a staff person and explained that I would, from our conversations, I've talked to some of you in answer to your questions before the board meeting, uh, I advise her that we would probably not grant this unless there were another staff member came in who also wanted a job share, we reviewed it, could recommend it, and so forth. Um, and I, I really frankly need to hear from you what your opinions are, what your thoughts on this are, and also is there any policy or is there any, uh, does anybody recall a specific discussion of job share that sets a precedent for how this district will deal with that issue? I don't recall any discussion of it, but I'm very much in favor of job sharing because I think it does allow people to uh, both work, which they may have to do, uh, but more importantly, uh, engage in parenting. And uh, you know, if I were going to speak to it on a larger issue, I would say that if the United States had an industrial policy uh, or a labor policy, it would include uh, provisions which would uh, give parents considerably more support than they get now. Well, I, I agree in principle, but I think we, we have to be cognizant of the jobs these people are doing and make sure that, that this is not detrimental, these particular situations are not detrimental to the kids in any way. I think a lot of job share situations do um, work out very well, but I think particularly at the younger grades, you have to be awfully careful. Um, that, the, that the people who are doing it have a well thought out plan and then the communication is in place and it's not simply for the benefit of the teacher. Um, 
And I think some situations are better that way than others. Well, I certainly, if I didn't say I was in favor of that, I, I meant to. <laughs> uh, yeah, it has to work. I mean, the administrators, uh, you know, have to be satisfied, and obviously the, the children have to be served first and foremost. And I sort of assumed that uh, you wouldn't propose a specific instance if you weren't very confident that that would, could be accomplished. And at what point do you feel that the job share is, is a benefit to children? Well, I think in, in the fourth and fifth grades now where there's the, the team teaching, that seems to be working out very well in, in many instances and in the, the situation at the fifth grade level where there are two part-time teachers. That seems, they seem to be very compatible. It's well thought out. They each uh, teach to their strengths. Um, I think it's a little more problematic at the lower grades. In kindergarten, it's not such a big issue because you have, you know, if you have one teacher teach one section and one another, they're not, they're not dealing with the same kids. But I think there are those other grades, first, second, third, where um, it's maybe a little more of an issue. We have a third grade teaming approach too because we have the language arts right. coordinator and, and, that, and math that's, coordinator. Yeah, and, and I think that has worked out fine. Um, there is another situation that um, well, we had, we had one situation last year where there were two part-time teachers and then one went out on maternity leave, so there was a long-term substitute. I think that ended up being tough on the kids. And I think we just need to be cognizant that we are dealing, you know, with a whole classroom full of kids, too, and um, make sure it's to their advantage. At the lower level, I, I'm sure at the, at the upper elementary level, the teachers are there a half day each, correct? At, at the lower elementary level, is that is it the same way? One comes in from from eight to ten forty-five, and the other who's from eleven to the end of school, or do they teach yeah, it's like one well, teach one day and one teach always, another some day? Some of them do one day, the next day trade off. And for instance, one teacher will teach two and a half two days, two full days and one half day. Yeah, I could see problems with that. Yeah, because you're really not teaching to your strength. That, that's, I, I did not know that, but I, I can see that that could be uh, not maybe in the best interest of the students. I, I think that argument primarily um, supports the concept that the application needs to be a completed application, that it's, you can't evaluate half of an application. If you're looking at a team, you have to look at the team and, and in my judgment, leave it to the discretion of the superintendent and the administrator whether that team will function as m more than one half plus one half or less than one half and plus one half. And I think there are situations where it can function on either side and I would expect the judgment of the superintendent and the administrators to be most skilled at determining that mix. I, I do want to strengthen that point um, to say that uh, we have several situations in the third grade we're talking about full-time staff. It's just their teaching assignment that is part-time. One of the concerns that I have in first, second, third grade and probably fourth um, is uh, team meetings and things, uh, half-time teacher, are they available? Um, I have the same problem with shared staff at the middle school and the high school for that same reason. You know, where does the day end? Where does the day begin? I would like to say um, in being a school board watcher for three years, which is when most of these arrangements have come up. Uh, my assumption was always that it was individual consideration. And I do hope that it becomes an individual consideration issue and not a matter of fact. That if someone applies for a part-time position, it's assumed that it will be granted. And that it is part of a package which includes the other half or whatever. And that the design is firm at the beginning and not, well, we'll get around to it. Um, yeah, I would just like to extend um, what Rosemary said. And, I, and I, I do think we need to be careful that a, that a situation that began as a child care situation doesn't just become a long-standing habit um, without, you know, a real, real plan in place. Yeah, I, I'd like to see it be stated as part of our philosophy or something that we think that, that this is a, a positive experience for kids and have some consistency in it rather than just 
well, here are two people, and, and for their benefit or how they want to care for their children, this is how they decide to do it, rather than us saying, here is our way of thinking about job sharing and how we feel it works best for children. Can your plans fit into this? So you haven't, as a board, there hasn't been any real discussion of this issue. No. I'm, I'm getting that feeling. <laughs> well, I couldn't find anything in policy or minutes, and uh, in my discussion with people, it was, it seemed to be an issue that needed to be examined by the board. Um, it's very difficult to write a policy in this area. I can assure you I've tried to do it on two or three occasions, and I've looked at other districts doing it. Um, but what we certainly do need are some guidelines. For instance, for the staff, they need to know what they're supposed to do. In other words, I have uh, asked um, this year to make sure that we begin to have that conversation internally. Uh, you are also raising other issues that I don't believe have been reviewed, which has to do what are the extent of the obligations for faculty meetings and so on and so forth. And this, this is frankly a very complicated piece, and there are, it's a ripe area for uh, confusion and misunderstanding and sometimes hard feelings when people get into a situation they haven't understood what's expected and they and they either think we're being unreasonable or we think they're being unreasonable so all of these things need to be discussed and that's what I need to know tonight I can um, recommend to you the ones that have been ongoing um, and I will uh, and the staff member knows that I'm doing that uh, withhold the new request and and I've asked that one to be reviewed and see if there is it I'm not saying there's not a possibility of doing it well but it's an incomplete request at this point. Yeah, there, there's one issue that you raised, which uh, is a negotiation issue, so I can't really comment too much on it in public, but uh, that, that would be the issue of a, a teacher that's on half time coming back and being able to bump a teacher that's on full time by virtue of seniority. Well, it's certainly, I mean, believe yeah. me, these are why we have to be careful about it, yeah. because if you uh, all of a sudden, for a variety of reasons, you could have a uh, scenario where you had a significant number of your staff who were basically staff on continuing contract with a with a contractual right to full time employment, who had requested and been granted part time work, uh, and all of a sudden at the end of that that contract year, they say, well, of course I'm going back to full time. Well, if that happened, where across the board, if you don't anticipate these things you can get into a terrible situation yeah. well it would have to be spelled out uh, so you have to be very you do have to think down and i don't think it is right now i no, guess that's my not. observation it's not my in the present it's not either so i'm yeah. attempting so. to do that and well the other part of the dilemma is what if we have a have a request here from one person and we don't have it from the other half or the other assumed half how do we i, I mean then we approve one person's not knowing the intention of the other person? I, thought I don't these see how were, we can. So I don't understand. I understand the cross and powers. Right. That's a team. But I understand these other two, Deborah Jordan Pearson and Ingrid Stressinger. Are they a team? No. no. Okay. Uh, I thought, excuse me. I'm sorry. That's my error. I thought we had a letter from uh, Leslie. Uh, Leslie was employed as a half-time uh, generalist when she she doesn't fall into that category. Okay. And, but they have been teaming, and their intention is to continue teaming. That was my understanding. Okay. That's what that is. So that what we have here is a situation where we already – the request for the half-time position is from um, Ingrid because has she has a full-time, but her counterpart is only half-time. Okay, so okay. This, but I, I, I think that that's, that does raise, however, you see, technically, there's another issue here. I have to go back into the records and check on exactly what we have our understanding with uh, Leslie is, when that started, what the, what the issues are. I mean, it is my understanding that that's been a working team and they want to continue that working team, and I'm comfortable with the administration's recommendation that continue to be a working team. But from a contract point of view, I do need to. Uh, okay. The other one is Deborah Pearson. She, I know she's a kindergarten That's teacher. That's correct. Who is her counterpart? Well, she doesn't need a counterpart. Okay. I mean, at the kindergarten level, if you make a request to be at the half time, okay. each of those groups are separate groups. Okay. So it's not considered job sharing in that sense. And the Margaret Welch. That's that one, that's just that's for your information. No. Okay. Yeah. 
maybe this is a stupid question, but what, what is a generalist? What is a half-time generalist? Um, Thank you. But where, where is she a classroom teacher? Besides Leslie. to Leslie. She's a second Right, ha have to, okay, but that's all you meant. She's just, okay. She doesn't have some other, I, I, the way you said it, I thought there was another half. She was, a, she was hired as a kindergarten teacher uh, at half time and she was a second grade teacher. Charlie is something. No, she doesn't. That one still bothers me. Why she's a half time teacher? She doesn't, that's an approved position. Apparently, again, we're, we're, what, we, what we're doing here, since this has not been something that has you know, started out with a clear sense of what the various factors are, and I'm kind of really going into history here to try to understand it. Uh, what I'm hearing is that uh, Leslie was hired as a half-time teacher. She was never a full-time teacher, correct? The contract was always half, that's my understanding. I would have obviously have to check that. Um, if that's the case, and then at some point the job share came about, the request came about using that half-time teacher and having a full-time teacher requesting to, uh, to go to half-time, it made two pieces that would fit together. Perfectly appropriate but still something that needs to be reviewed on a year to year basis. I, I, just an observation, she's not the only .5 teacher we've hired in the elementary school, is that correct? Probably not, I mean I certainly haven't gone over past records to get, I, in fact some of the records do not yield that information, that's why I'm discussing it because um, sometimes board members remember and it's, there's no record of it. Uh, I think we hired a .5 kindergarten teacher in September. Yes, we did. My concern uh, about the budget is and the movement of staff uh, and the .5 teaching contracts and what our uh, responsibilities are to those teachers and if I could have that sometime soon. It's, frankly, it's rather simple. In other words, the, when they're in first and second year, the, um, they are, you know, with the pretty vulnerable to cutbacks and what have you. Um, but I'd like to, I, my own, my past practice, uh, I've learned sometimes the hard way to be scrupulous about trying to pin down when we hire somebody, is this strictly for one year? For instance, somebody goes out on childcare leave for a year. You hire somebody to take that person's place and the contract should be spelled out as a one year contract. Unfortunately, it gets complicated because if you have a staff person on a one-year contract and then you have the same person maybe on another one-year contract filling another slot, you, then you have a person, if you hire them for a third one-year contract, you have to put them on continuing contract because in fact they have served their probationary period. So um, there are no, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff in all of this and I, I, it's, you know, 930 and we don't need to perhaps go through it all. I, I think you've clarified my need to know where the board stands on this, where you've been in the past. I see some things that we need to uh, clarify and um, I think I know where to go from here. Ann? I just have to say one more thing. There was a comment in, in one of these letters about um, substitute teachers approaching for possible job shares and I think we need to be really careful about um, you know who the teachers are and who the substitutes are and where we're, we seem to be getting to a little bit of a fuzzy point about which are substitutes and which are our, our teachers. Well, uh, yes, you know, I mean, actually, one of the things you have to also understand, I think, about uh, elementary teaching, and I don't want to pick on elementary teaching, but it seems to be more of an issue in elementary teaching. We are a profession that has, a, we hire a lot of young women of childbearing age. That is a fact. And we like having children, um, teachers who are child oriented, many of them having their own children. Uh, so that from a standpoint, frankly, of staffing, one has to understand that it has impacts on substitute accounts, it has impacts on a variety of just this kind of issue. And I, I think we, we should not lose sight of what Peter was saying, that because we are an agency dealing with children, we certainly ought to be modeling 
concern for our teachers to be good parents and to combine their professional and their parenting roles. Nevertheless, I have found that it is really important for boards and superintendents and staff to be crystal clear, or at least as crystal clear as we can be, about how some of these things can rise up to haunt us, because you can have all of a sudden what is a nice gentlemanly agreement turn out to be a real contractual uh, buzz off with people who all of a sudden think they have rights, or in fact do have rights, that we are not prepared to deal with. So that's all I'm trying to lay out for you, is that these things are unbelievably complicated if you can't lay out a few predictions. So that's all I'm trying to do. And, you know, this, here again, I'm still surprised, <laughs> and so this is going through my mind, but I, I, I really question the continuity of a teacher teaching two and a half days and then the other one come in and teaching another two and a half days. However they break it up, how do you have continuity in a situation like that? Well, I'm not, to be honest with you, I've, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to discuss all the ins and outs of exactly how these, these are done. I am more familiar with some of the shares on the subject matter. Uh -huh. Issues. That, that I understand. And the and, subject and matter issues. That's very good. Right. They can do that. And some, I ha, I'm aware of some of that practice that goes on there where you just decide that today will be that concentration on that. It seems to work, so work well. Well, I actually read an article about uh, two women who shared a job, and I can't remember the industry. I think it was investment banking or insurance or I mean, it had nothing to do with teaching. But what they did was uh, they had a uh, Wednesday was the switchover day. They had. Uh, extensive communications back up in the form of uh, computers and telephones but on Wednesday night they had a conference on their own time and then they had another conference over the weekend mm -hmm. in which they passed the baton and uh, they put an enormous amount of effort into into this but they uh, they, they got rave reviews from mm -hmm. uh, for having pulled it off that was probably with adults but I'm it was with adults it, it was I'm not, I'm <laughs> I, 16 seven year olds <laughs> It, it absolutely can be done, you know. That my only point is, and I'm very supportive of job share situations, but I think we have to remember where, you know, we're talking about li a lot of little children who are impacted too, and I just want to make sure that there is a clear plan in place and that it is advantageous to the children as well as to the adults, that's all. Beth? Yeah, I think this is really important to, to clarify. We I'm still having a problem with the Ingrid Stressinger approval, not at this time because we are not, we have not been notified that the other half of her team is going to continue her contract. So the, yeah, She's that's what. She's on continuing contract as a half-time teacher. The other half is on continuing contract. I see what you Wait, mean. Do you see what I mean? Yes, we're I talking do. about, yeah, we're talking about yeah. a team coming together that we know our balance. Mm -hmm. What happens if for some reason Leslie does not accept okay, to I continue? We have, ex we have approved a half-time position for a, for a full-time teacher. This is my concern. What we're missing here is the explicit spelling out of that team. I think it was our understanding that that's why we don't have that as, as written in the <coughs> team. That's we, can, why we can table that okay. for tonight and come back with it. And it's not that I'm against Ingrid Stressinger mm -hmm. because I had a childhood pet her, so and she had a good experience. Okay. So we will table Kelly Manahan and Ingrid Stressinger and vote tonight on Deborah Jordan Pearson, Deborah Cross, and Barbara Powers. Right. Okay. Do I hear a motion to accept for one year assignment uh, Deborah Jordan Pearson, Deborah Cross, and Barbara Powers for half-time positions. So who? Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, just so long as we do have the understanding we are going to work through this, mm -hmm. <laughs> this half-time issue. Well, I think what we're doing is we're saying that uh, it has to be a matched pair when it comes to the board for approval. I think that's what that 
last discussion just said, uh, the administrators have to be absolutely in favor of it and assure us that the children are going to be well served. And uh, finally, we're going to deal with some uh, some issues of seniority and clusters and bumping rights, et cetera. And is there anything else? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would recommend sending to the policy subcommittee to look at this and come back with either a recommendation as an administrative um, procedure or a policy. And I, and I, in turn, would like to bump it to Connie to talk to the ad administrators about what they would like to see, and then we'll work on their work from their proposal. And right I'd like to offer to the contract negotiation for the teachers. <laughs> 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 Actually, it doesn't usually wind up in that level. Um, <laughs> it, it really is a policy issue. When, when you get into it, it becomes a policy issue. This is just to keep it from dying. <laughs> yes, okay. it doesn't sound like it's going <laughs> to die. <laughs> Could I ask in that policy review recommendation that we also deal with benefits on the proportional share of benefits, or maybe that's negotiations? That, uh, that is actually, uh, if you are in a part-time contract, we have language that prorates Thank all you. benefits. Yeah, we do that automatically. We, we had a second already, too. Okay. Okay. We've had our discussions. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't forgotten to vote yet. Come on. No, no, I wasn't going to forget to vote. I was just, okay, all in favor. Okay, there we go. Okay, school board policies, first reading. Somebody from the policy committee want to say something, or does anybody on the board have any comments about the policies that they've read? It is a first reading. Charlie. Um, the school property's disposable procedure, and under Section A, the charges for municipal purchases shall be determined by the superintendent after consultation with the board, or in parentheses, you've got the board's finance subcommittee. I think we should make a decision who it's going to be, the board as a mm -hmm. whole, or is it going to be our new finance subcommittee? Well, I think it ought to be the finance subcommittee. Yeah. Although I suppose if uh, it were something of an extraordinary value, but I don't, I think that's academic. Would we be disposing of anything of significant value, Peter? I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm serious. But I, I don't I'm know. Not really. I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> don't get me going. <laughs> Those are extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments about any of these? All right. That's the first reading. So we'll bring that back for a second reading. Uh, the last thing is a school board appointee to the athletic fee and co-curricular committees. Do I have a volunteer? Well, I'm the incumbent on the athletic fee committee, although I'm willing to be bumped if there's a uh, a volunteer. I have an interest, but I don't want to bump anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I've had it for, I think, four years, three years. Okay. So, Rosemary. Thank you. We are appointee. All to right. both committees? For both? Oh, I'm two sorry. Which There's one two did committees. you want to do? The athletic fee or the co-curricular? Um, I'll do both or either. I'm athletic. I know, I'm not I'm Peter. On the <laughs> <laughs> I'm reasonably athletic too, but uh, that's not what I meant. All right. How about do you want to do athletic and you do co-curricular? That'll be fine. Good. Okay. <laughs> Thank so you. So I didn't get bumped. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we need uh, consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel issue and negotiations. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? The meeting is adjourned.